Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, and access and enjoyment of the great outdoors. Today's episode is the first in the series we are producing with the National Marine Sanctuaries as they celebrate 50 years of ocean conservation and stewardship. Our guest today is Dr. Michelle Johnston. Michelle is a research ecologist and NOAA dive master at the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Dr. Michelle Johnson, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. Well, I am excited that we are launching the series with the National Marine Sanctuary and the fact that you raised your hand and stepped up, you're number one, which you, you get all the accolades going forward. But I was like really excited to, you know, learn about your journey, what it means to be a research ecologist and talk about the, you know, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary and, you know, 50 years of being around and this, this commitment to conservation and stewardship, that just means a lot. And I, I wonder if we could perhaps start a little bit about with your story. How did you decide, hey, I want to be a research ecologist? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually grew up in landlocked Ohio. So Lake Erie was the closest thing I knew to the ocean. And I don't know, I had that bug when I was a kid. My, both my parents are teachers and did a wonderful job making sure I had lots of opportunities. And I was always fascinated by the ocean. You know, I would get my Ranger Rip like magazines when I was little with, you know, flag ones with sea turtles or dolphins or whales. And I work on a lot of invasive species and lionfish now. And I just like, when I was home, not too long ago, found a lionfish, like from fourth grade, a lionfish report that I had done. I didn't even remember it, but it's funny to go back. I, I had a passion and a drive and I was very lucky that again, my parents supported me to do things. I got certified to dive when I was 14 years old. And my mom always made sure that we were on vacation, like down to the Florida Keys or to the Caribbean where I could dive. She was very selfless and just wanted to make sure that my interests, you know, would, would be supported. And I applied to go to school at North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. It's a fabulous program. They've got a great marine lab and it's the only school I applied to. That put the fear of God in my mother that I wasn't going to get in as an out of state <laughs> student. And I was sure, you know, I worked hard and had good grades. I had lots of volunteer stuff. I had my scuba certification. I'm like, this is where I'm going. And my mom was like, okay. And I applied early and got in and left Ohio to go to North Carolina and really never looked back after that. And that started my, my career in the, in the marine sciences. That's fantastic. You know, I'd love to circle back just a little bit and unpack a couple of the items you shared growing up in landlocked Ohio. I have to ask, did you get your certification in the infamous quarry in Ohio? <laughs> no, no. We actually went down to the Bahamas and I, the whole vacation, you know, most people are out on the beach. I was at the dive shop studying and doing a two week course that whole vacation and worked really hard. And then every year after that, we went somewhere where I could dive. I had an uncle who was a scuba diver, who was like a father to me. And uh, we dove together, my dive buddy. And again, my family really supported my dreams and aspirations to be a marine scientist. Wow. And what I'm also taking away is you do what you wanted to do from a very young age. Yeah, I'm really lucky. I don't know. I just knew, I knew, I knew in my soul, that's what I wanted to do. And I know some people don't, you know, it takes a while and they try different things. I mean, my husband is a person who definitely had many different paths throughout his career. And I, it's hard for me to relate to that because I always knew, I always knew this is what I wanted. And I don't know, everybody's different, but that's my story. You know, okay. I, I knew what I wanted. You know, that's your story. You got to stick with it. And yeah. obviously to me, and I think it's going to be to our listeners, 
you know, this passion of yours, it, you're, you're making a difference in the world. And it, it, I think we all make a difference in the world. The career coach in me says we all have an opportunity to make a difference in the world, but you actually are doing it each and every day because you're helping to manage and being a steward of this phenomenal outdoor sanctuary, you know, the Flower Garden Banks National Sanctuary. And how did this opportunity with the National Marine Sanctuary came, come about? Because you had your undergraduate degree, you went to graduate school, you got your master's, your PhD. How did the this opportunity with NOAA come about for you? Yeah, and I, I talk about this a lot to a lot of graduate students looking for that next step. But as I was finishing up grad school, there's an awesome fellowship. It's called the Canals Fellowship, and it's funded through the National Sea Grant Program through NOAA. And NOAA, I had the research grants to fund my research in graduate school that was supported by NOAA. So I had a lot of NOAA support, but this Canal Fellowship is for graduate students who are finishing their master's or PhD and wanting to go into some type of science or policy work. So I applied. I was very lucky to get that fellowship and it, it takes you to DC for a year and you get placed within a program. You have to interview like with Department of State, with NOAA, with you know, yay, there's all kinds of different opportunities that I knew I wanted to be with Joe. <laughs> and so I interviewed with the National Marine Sanctuary Program, and this is the overall program at headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland, in the DC area. And it was my number one pick. And luckily, I was their number one pick because you rank the offices you want to be at, and then they rank you. And the, the driver for me was to be able to dive. I wanted to get paid to go diving, that was a goal. And then to be able to do research and to adventure, right? Like I'm an adventurer. I want to see places. I want to go different places. I want to see sanctuaries. And there was the ability to travel. And I just really lucked out. I mean, I think that I've worked hard to get where I am, but I also think I've had an extraordinary amount of luck and people support me. And I was able to be placed with sanctuaries and it is led me to this beautiful career where I've gotten to travel all around the world and I just have a back and um, I just love NOAA. I love the sanctuary program. I think it's a great cause. You know, they're basically like underwater parks, you know, these places where you can go recreate and dive and you can fish. Like, yes, you can go fishing in the sanctuary. You can kayak. There's all wonderful aspects of the sanctuary program. We protect shipwrecks in some of them. You know, they're all different. And so that's what makes them cool. And I'm just really happy to be a part of it. I think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> you know, that, that's fantastic. And, and I love, you know, your enthusiasm really comes across when you start to speak about this. And I don't know if you realize that, but all of a sudden you just lit up. And for our oh. guests, when you go and watch the YouTube version of this or on our website, you're going to see Michelle just light up here. I, I love this series we're doing now with NOAA and the National Marine Sanctuaries, because in the spirit of full disclosure, up until I met Vernon and your peer, and I, and I know I should know what her name was, but I, you know, it, I apologize, but when they were speaking to my peers at the Outdoor Writers Association of America, I have to admit, I had, I know of NOAA because I, you know, I had a, a college professor I did research with at NOAA. I remember I would check NOAA radio when it was time to go out. We'd go sailing out on Lake Michigan. I never, and I know national parks. I live in Nevada. We have national parks all around us. I never knew there were national marine sanctuaries. And, yeah. and that little piece never knowing that there's a national marine sanctuary. Is that unusual? In some places it is, in some places it isn't. For the Flower Garden Bank, where I'm at, so I'm based in Galveston, Texas, the Flower Gardens is offshore, a hundred miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. So our remote sanctuary, yeah, we come across that because if you can't see it, you can't easily touch it. It's hard to relate to. But like, if you go down to the Florida Keys, you know, 
all of that for the most part is the marine sanctuary. If you go to California and you're at Monterey Bay, you're, you're, you walk the beach and then put your toes in sanctuary waters. It's a little bit easier to relate to. So we do come across that a lot. And the, the sanctuary program was designated by the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, and we are mandated to do education. That, that's part of the gig with sanctuary. And so our education team, both at the local site and at headquarters works really hard to educate and promote and do outreach so that more and more people realize that these special places exist. Um, but obviously we still have more work to do. And if, you know, like me, you grew up in Ohio, you're in Ohio, you know, you're, you're not at a marine sanctuary off or you're in Nevada. Yeah. You have Lake Mead, but you know, you don't know much about the flower garden. So, you know, it's, it's a lot about location and where you are, but. The, the education team and the scientists too work really hard to make sure that, you know, more and more people realize that these special things exist. Very good. And I have to share, I was out at Lake Mead yesterday. I was hiking at a time of the day I had no business hiking at, but I was walking down towards the water and I was seeing shells from the crustaceans. I was like, that was just very surreal as I'm walking on shells where five years ago I would have been underwater. Yeah, I, my, my sister actually works, she works for the park service at Lake Mead. I was there a couple weeks ago and, you know, that's a, you know, sanctuaries have their regulations and, you know, things we manage. Lake Mead, the whole different issue with your guys' you know, little water levels and you know, it's interesting where everything is. Right. With the, the flower garden banks, to worry, 100 miles out, what are the... But it, I want to talk about the conservation aspect of it, but all the stewardship aspect, but also the recreation. Now, as you mentioned earlier, you can go angling, fishing, kayaking, diving, other outdoor enthusiast activities are promoted in the sanctuary boundaries. Yeah. So at Flower Gardens, again, it's a little different if we're remote, you know, for for the sanctuary locations that are coastal, things like kayaking and birding and things like that are, are, are really common. That flower gardens, you know, it's a, it's an investment to get out that far to the bank. So it's really scoop diving is, is the main draw because it is this gem in the Gulf of Mexico. These reefs are amazing. They're beautiful. I'm not going to say pristine because hardly anything is pristine anymore. But they're some of the healthiest reefs in the Caribbean region. So it really is this awesome dive destination and divers pay a lot of money to come. We've got okay. whale sharks, we've got manta rays, we've got turtles, we've got grouper and snapper and all the beautiful reef fish that you think of when you think of coral reefs. So it really is a wonderful dive destination, but most divers come out. There's one recreational dive boat that services the area and it's a live aboard vessel. And that's how we do our research. So when you're coming out to the flower garden, you're coming out for two, three, four days at a time. And you're, it's like summer camp, like scoop a summer camp on the boat and you get to dive with friends and it's great. And then the fishermen, you know, love both the banks, but they also love the oil and gas platforms that are surrounding in the area. The Gulf of Mexico is a super weird place. We've got all this oil and gas industry and then these beautiful reefs. So it's interesting, but the platforms attract a lot of fish. So we do see fishermen that come to the sanctuary to fish. Only hook and line is allowed. You can't spear fish. You can't do any like trawling that would disturb the bottom habitat. But those are the two main things where you know, recreation is, is really supported this far offshore. Okay. And you, you raised a question that I'd also had about uh, the, the oil platforms and this reef system that's out there. It, it's not insignificant in size. It's, there's a lot of geographic area. I mean, you're a hundred miles out, a lot of geographic area. It, it, it sounds like you are living in, in symbiotic relationship. I guess maybe that's the right word. I don't know if that's the right word. You're the scientist. You'll correct me. But <laughs> you've got the oil industry and you've got this conservation stewardship through the sanctuaries. And it sounds like you're living together. You both have, you're, you're doing your thing and they're doing their thing and that's okay. 
Yeah. And I think over time we've shown that the two can operate as said band and band. Now, obviously I get a lot of questions about the deep water horizon oil spill that happened in 2010 and that was tragic and it was terrible. Luckily for the sanctuary, the oil did not make it that far west and were not impacted by that, but other areas were. But in general, you know, the oil and gas industry does operate in a very thick and the federal agency that regulates that, that's the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, we actually work hand to hand with them as they help fund some of our coral reef monitoring to make sure that if there ever were a tragic event like that, you know, we have the data in place to know what those baseline conditions are so that restoration can happen in the future. We're going to pray that that never happens, but, you know, we, we are supportive of each other and you know, obviously nobody wants anything bad to happen. So, of course, and I, I think, you know, the record does show that around these areas, things have been relatively safe and there is little pollution from industry on the reef, which is a great okay. thing. Very, very good. I'm very fortunate. So I, I'm curious, what is a, I don't know. I, I don't feel like a day is sufficient or perhaps even a week. Let's go a month if we have to go back down to a week, but what's a month or a week uh, in the life of Michelle Johnson at the National Marine Sanctuaries and Flower Garden Banks? Yeah, so it depends on the season. And uh, the past two years have been really abnormal with the pandemic. I mean, I'm here at my home office right now because we're still teleworking a lot for the most part. But, you know, a typical month in the summer we're offshore quite a bit. And so we're spending a lot of our time prepping for field work. Like I mentioned before, we do a lot of monitoring. We're making sure the pools are healthy, the fish are healthy. We've got an 82 foot research vessel, which is awesome. It's called the RV Manta. And we're usually out for three or four days at a time doing field work. We're doing coral surveys, fish surveys, underwater photography, different types of sampling, specifically for water quality. And in the summertime, you know, it's like, go offshore for the week, come back in the weekend, load the new gear you want, go back out on the boat, do it all over again. It's busy. And then in the off season, we're analyzing all the data. And for a lot of people, that's like the more boring part, you know, where we're going through, doing our statistics, writing our papers, trying to publish things. But as a scientist, that's kind of cool too for me, you know, like I like working up the data and seeing, you know, that the coral is still, still healthy, or maybe we had bleaching and, you know, the coral struggled that year. And then we get to publish that and communicate that out to the public. And then our education team takes that information so that they can do their outreach. And so, you know, that kind of sums it up in the summertime, we're busy, we're diving, we're doing the glamorous part, you know, of the marine science job. And then fall and winter, it's a lot of the data analysis and writing and all those skills that you really learn in school that you've got to, you know, put to work. I love that. And for our listeners, we're going to provide backlinks, not only to the, the social sites for the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, but as well as to the, the NOAA website for the National Marine Sanctuary. And Michelle, one thing that I really was amazed is those are pretty substantive pages for every sanctuary. The data that you are collecting is, is amazing. And I was looking at the, I guess it's the topography data at each section of the, of the, the sanctuary and also, you know, what you were collecting and, and for our listeners, you got to go out and visit it if you're a data person, if you're visual and you want to see some great photos and it's just, it's an, there's an amazing collection of information that you are collecting and you're also sharing with the public. And as you said, you know, you are the, 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 it can be glamorous. If you take that data, you turn it into a paper or a presentation or application for a grant. So you're continuing to do work 365 days a year that that's making a difference. I love that. Yeah, something I just want to mention really quick is that, you know, the data goes, you know, we're not just collecting data for data. It's, it's going in to promote policy change and to promote conservation and the flower gardens case in point. So the flower gardens was designated in 1992 
and then a bank was added six years or four years later in 1996. So the Flower Garden Banks has been three banks for a really long time, but last year the sanctuary expanded. And so we have 14 additional banks. It was a really long process to get to that expansion, but all the data that was collected on coral health and fisheries, a lot of mapping data that you mentioned went into that. And so, you know, all of this research was compiled. We had a lot of public meetings and there was a lot that went into it, but the sanctuaries figured out, you know, we are conserving more essential habitat areas in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's something that the Flower Gardens team is really proud of, you know, because a lot of work went into that expansion and we had support from oil and gas. We had support from the fishing industry to do that. And we have a bigger sanctuary job. So it's a success story and a win story for everybody in my book. I love it. I love it. Not to go negative, and this is not negative, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see for the Flower Garden Bank's sanctuary look going forward? What are some of those? Yeah, I mean, there's days where sometimes it's hard to be positive. The Flower Gardens, as I mentioned, is extremely healthy right now. These banks being remote, they're 100 miles offshore, as I mentioned, have a little bit more protection than like reefs that you see in Florida that are coastal and are impacted by coastal pollution. The sanctuary for the flower garden is also deeper. So the reef doesn't start to about 60 feet. So the flower garden's reef is on salt domes. So it's kind of like underwater mountain. And these mountains come up so high that corals were able to colonize and get enough light to grow. So it's call it the coral cap. And then as you go deeper, you start to get into deeper, what we call mesophotic habitats and you know, the coral changes. And so there's lots of different habitats in the sanctuary, not just the coral, that it changes as you go down deep. But the coral cap is the area that we all know the most about, and it's what we think about when we think of the flower gardens. And so as we experience changes in climate, we are seeing increased bleaching. That's where the water gets really hot and the corals get stressed and they basically spit out their symbiotic algae. And without that algae, they can't make well. And so when you have a bleached reef, the corals are starving and it's awful to see. It's really sad. And we've done climate model where it's predicted that by 2040, flower gardens will expand experience bleaching at a rate where it will be stressed and not recover the way now. I mean, that is less than 20 years away. You know, it stresses me out. <laughs> and they, they have a new term there, and you probably know it, called like environmental depression or environmental distress, uh, where you start thinking about these things and you get a sense of just, you know, depression and there's not much you can do about it. And in a way that is true, you know, like as a sanctuary, we can't manage for, you know, increasing temperatures, but there's things that we can do to help the reef not be stressed. And so one of the things that I worry about is, is bleaching and the corals getting sick repeatedly and not having the energy to recover. Invasive species is also one of those things that a lot of people know about lionfish. The lionfish. And I, I do a lot of lionfish work. And so. You know, things that we can do to help the reef, you know, you know, limit diving interaction, you know, don't mess with the coral. We can remove lionfish and we do that with permits. So even though hook and line fishing is what's permanent, we do issue special permits to go and fear lionfish. And by keeping those invasive coal on a routine keeps the basin from the reef, you know, that helps, you know, the native fish population stay healthy and stable. Maintaining our mooring buoy so that boats aren't anchoring on the reef. You know, those are things we can do to keep the sanctuary healthy and productive. And so that's where I focus on. And then, as you mentioned earlier, the education and outreach, that's so big, right? You know, even if you're a kid growing up in Ohio, like how I was, what can I do? You know, simple things like yes, recycling water and all that stuff really does add up. And so you know, I try not to get too depressed thinking about, 
you know, coral reefs and how things will be in the future and focus on the positives and how we can affect positive change. Very good. Very good. So I'm curious, in, as you mentioned about the outreach, visitors, you know, mom, you know, a, a class, mom and dad with their kids who have their child, just like you, who's enthusiastic about open water and diving. And they, so they want to come out and spend some days out at the, at the, the reef. What type of interaction are you having with them? Yeah, so a lot of people ask, you know, how can we get to the flower gardens? And that's hard because if you're not a certified diver or fisher with a boat, you know, it, it's not not realistic. So our education team works a lot with aquariums. And so we have wonderful exhibits. Our local aquarium here is called Moody Gardens, and they have a flower garden banks exhibit. So it's like you can go to the aquarium and see what the flower gardens is like. We also have a partnership with the Tennessee Aquarium and the Texas State Aquarium, and they have similar exhibits. So that's kind of our way, being a remote site where you can't go like to the beach and put your toes in the sanctuary, seeing the aquarium facilities and the Houston Zoo has some stuff too that, you know, really get people into front. And I can relate to that. Growing up in Ohio, we had a sea world in Ohio. And I remember being a little kid and getting to be able to do a whale. And that, like, did it for I was little. I was fascinated. So I know yeah. some people have negative things to say about at but from an outreach perspective, they're amazing. You know, to get people hooked and get I mean, that's a great way of, you know, of starting the educational process and, you know, cause you're looking to create a spark that, that somebody suddenly, wow, I want this, I want this as my career, which is what you did. So during the off season, I would imagine that you have opportunities to speak to classes, students, whether you know, graduates, high, you know, undergraduates, high school students. What's that interaction like for you? All of the above. We do education programs with the elementary schools in the area, high school, and sometimes I even guest, guest lecture at Texas A&M Galveston here. So I love it. I love working with students. That's one of the great things about NOAA is that, again, we are mandated to do some education stuff. And so even though my primary role is science, I get to dabble, you know, in the education and outreach. There is nothing more exciting than taking a dead lionfish to a class of third graders and doing a fish dissection and just watching them just get pumped. Now, like, they eat it up. They love it. And I love it too. And we do coral ID with the high school here with the a high school science group and I do like an overall lecture for the college students about the sanctuary and our monitoring trees management. So fun, you know, kids are curious and they're interested and they know, and they always have great questions and, and it's one of the perks of my job getting to do some of that outreach because you can tell some of them are passionate. And I, again, I, I I remember being that kid. I remember being excited about it. And I'm glad that we have that next generation of science. That's fantastic. Is there a, I don't know, an example where you were just kind of blown away by the, the, the question that was asked or this enthusiasm, any example that you could be able to share? Maybe not specifically, but you know, with doing lionfish dissections with one of the third grade classes here, you know, I just remember this one little boy knowing like every fact about the flower gardens possible. I felt like he knew more than me. And I was just blown away by the fact that he researched beforehand, knew his stuff, you know, was asking, he, he was asking me about cleaning stations, you know, cause fish will come like grouper will come and then get clean. The parasites cleaned off by smaller fish. And he knew about that in third grade, you know, I just, I, I love it. You know, I just love that stuff. So that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So I'm curious, Michelle, I mean, the, your accomplishments, you know, if starting out at a young age, 
you know, learning how to dive and, and kudos to your family that, you know, helped to, you know, nurture that, that enthusiasm, that desire. And, you know, now with the work that you're doing, is there anything that you would share back to your younger self about this journey you have been on? I guess I would just share, you know, be, be open to anything and say yes to things that, you know, maybe you might be a little scared to do, you know, don't, don't push away opportunities. I think one of my favorite quotes is that, you know, we're, it, it's our light that most scares us, not the darkness, the light. And so sometimes we're afraid to shine. And so I, I would just, you know, tell students, don't look for ourselves that, you know, go for it as best you can and don't look back. Cause you know, with that, you know, let quiet women never make history or whatever only loud women do, you know, you just gotta, you gotta go for it. Especially as a, a woman in science, a, a woman in science, you know, you just really gotta go. <laughs> I love and, it. And don't be, don't be intimidated. Yeah. I love it. I love it. You know, before we head out, we have a couple of features for our, our show. One of them is called the aha moment. And this is kind of the context for it is something you were doing in the moment, the work, perhaps the you know, writing the, uh, the, the report or the, the teaching, presenting, when you really realize, man, I get to do this for a living. What is that aha moment for you? Yeah, so when I left Ohio to go to North Carolina for school, there was a sea turtle rehabilitation center not far from the Wilmington campus. So every Saturday, I got up. 6 a.m. and drove and volunteered my whole Saturday to work with these sea turtles. I was not partying on Friday nights. Like I was dedicated and love these turtles. And it, it was called the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. It's one of the best places in the world and they, they still take student volunteers. But they had a turtle, her name was Coquina, who had just come in, then hit by a boat with her carapace, her shell was impacted. So she had like epoxy bracing, see her lung. I mean, mm. it, it was, it was bad. And the, the lady who ran the sea turtle center said, your job today is to get this turtle to eat. Don't leave the tank until the turtle eats. And I was just like, okay. And I sat there for two hours with a pair of tongs and this dead squid going around the tank, trying to get her attention. And after two hours, she finally ate. And that was my moment where I was like, I get to work with the turtle. You know, this is amazing. I'm making a difference. This turtle is not dead because we are trying to get her better. And that wasn't when I was working for Noah. That was when I was still in school. But, you know, that experience led me to an internship at Walt Disney World, where I was working on the dive team. That led me to another internship where I did sea turtle nesting in South Carolina. And all of these experiences built me up so that I could be competitive for my position at NOAA. And so I get asked a lot, you know, what do I do? How do I, how do I get the job that you did? And, and I lucky that I had the means to volunteer as much as possible. Even when I lived in Ohio, I volunteered at the animal shelter on the weekends, just so I could get animal experience. It had nothing to do with the ocean, but it was animal husbandry experience. And then when I went to school, I worked at the sea turtle hospital, went my full, my full college career. It's one of the things that I, I love the most. I really like turtle. And now, you know, I get to go diving in our marine sanctuary and see healthy turtles. You know, so I've gone from rehabbing sick and injured turtles to, I see healthy turtles on the reef and it's come full circle. And I would just tell students, you know, as much as you can volunteer, as much as you can say yes to do right things and getting those experiences, getting involved, working hard. Yes. You know, you gotta work hard at your math and your science and your writing and all of that, but it's the experiences where you're learning, you know, where you're adventuring, where you're, you're having that time. Is, is what really builds you as a scientist. I can't emphasize that enough. And, and at least that's my experience. It's no, the experiences that 
got me and working hard. And then those people giving me good recommendations so I could keep moving on. I think that's fantastic. What a journey. What a journey. Now, before we head out, just a, a final segment we call insight to go. Now you've shared a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, we could have had a, a, you know, a dozen insights to go already, but is there a final insight that you would like to share with our listeners? Could be another quote, could be a book, an article, television show for that matter. And by the way, I'm thinking undersea world with Jacques Cousteau, but that's just me. But any insight to go that you would like to leave with our listeners to perhaps give them that spark or maybe help them, you know, share that spark with their child who is really unsure of where they want to go, what they want to do in their life. Yeah. You know, a lot of people bring up Jacques Cousteau, but that, that was like a little before my time, you know, my parents really enjoyed Jacques Cousteau. Thank you for that, um, by the way. Thank you for well, that. I just, it's, he's great. <laughs> he's great, but I don't relate to that so much. You know, what I grew up with was Steve Owen. I would watch, you know, the crocodile hunter on animal planet on the yeah. weekend and Jack Hanna, you know, his show for the Columbus Zoo gr growing up in Ohio, that's, those were the people that inspired me. And I, I loved Steve Orwin. I thought he was great. I've actually gotten to go to his facility, his zoo in Australia, and it's one of the cool. But, you know, th those are things that inspired me. One of the most influential people in my career is Gene Beasley, who ran the Sea Turtle Hospital in, in North Carolina. She has been awarded the National Geographic Ocean Heroes Award. She has dedicated her whole life to rehabbing turtles. She started it in her garage in North Carolina, and now she has like a state of the art sea turtle facility. So she's not necessarily a super famous person, but she's the one who I drew so much strength and just her depth for passion for turtles, something that inspired me and also my mom. It was a seventh grade science teacher. I actually had my mom because I lived in a small town in Ohio. She was my seventh grade science teacher and it's always been inspiring. So you just got to find the people that inspire you and draw support from there. And like I said, just get out there and, and do as much as you can, you know, volunteer and get those internships. And that's, what's really going to help boost you in the science world, in my opinion. I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. And we will provide the backlinks to the, the program out in North Carolina, Gene Beasley's program for the sea turtles rehabilitation, and to put that in the backlinks of our show notes. And speaking of backlinks in our show notes, we've got the, the National Marine Sanctuary, the, the NOAA website, as well as the Flower Garden Banks page. Uh, off of Noah, but I know you're also on Facebook and on Instagram, Twitter. So any other places we ought to know about and put those backlinks as well? Yeah, I would say a couple of more places just for, if there's students that are interested, the, I'll give you the link for the Canals Fellowship through Sea Grant. That's just a great opportunity for graduate students. And then we have another program that is specific for research and sanctuaries for graduate students called the Nancy Foster Fellowship Program. It's, it's highly coveted, but for graduate students interested in conducting research in marine sanctuaries, that's like a fully paid, you know, graduate, graduate fellowship. And so I can give you that as well. It's such a great. That's fantastic. Well, yeah, we'll provide the, the links to that as well. We'll get those from you after the, our, our call is over today. You know, it has been a pleasure, Michelle, just to learn more about you and your work. I, I feel like we have just literally have touched the, 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 the tip of the reef, you know, <laughs> the very tip of the reef, we've could have gone a lot deeper in a lot of other areas and perhaps somebody else would have had to take over from me because I only know what I was putting together and, but this is, this is a phenomenal uh, repository of work, library of work that you have put together. And I really just love the passion you have, you know, for, you know, the, the, the conservation, the stewardship and just, you know, basically doing what you love. And I mean, that is to me, that that's how cool is that? We get to do what we love each and every day. So thank you for taking the time to help us kick off the celebration of 50 years of 
Ocean Conservation and Stewardship by the National Marine Sanctuaries. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. All right. Stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and then you and I can have a final chat. Okay. All right, folks. What a phenomenal way to kick off the National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, 50 years of ocean conservation and stewardship. This celebration is going on this year and with Michelle Johnston, research ecologist and Noah Divemaster at the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. You know, we have, as I was suggesting, just touch the tip of the, of the reef, so to speak, not the iceberg, the reef. And, but really getting a flavor of Michelle's background, the work she has done, what she is passionate about, also talking about the impact that her work is having on this really phenomenal ecosystem, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Now we're going to provide all of the backlinks to the NOAA website for the National Marine Sanctuaries, as well as to the Flower Garden uh, sites as well, a website as well as social sites. And I know we have some more backlinks regarding the, the scholarships that we'll get from Michelle. We'll have those in the show notes too. Now we hope you enjoyed today's episode. So, you know, do go out, check out the, you know, the websites and really just immerse yourself in this, really this treasure that I didn't even know we had until just a few months ago. And it's like, wow, now I want to go visit, you know, the marine sanctuaries like Flower Garden Banks. And hopefully someday I will be able to do that. Now, in the meantime, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. We have some more coming up to help celebrate the 50th anniversary. And those will be coming up in the, in the coming weeks. You can also visit us and this ep see this episode on our website at the Outdoor Adventure Series .com. We're also on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages, Outdoor Adventure Series, and we are also on all of the major podcasting directories. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Take care of yourselves, your family. Become more aware of what's going on in our environment and, you know, check out this great work that NOAA is doing through the National Marine Sanctuary System. And if you're inclined, you know, join in on the celebration. We hope you will do that as well. Okay, so we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series. And again, as we celebrate 50 years of ocean conservation and stewardship with the National Marine Sanctuaries. Thank you so much.